Hello, everyone. This is David Robinson. I'm the Director of Membership and Meetings of the Linguistic Society of America. And uh, let's wait just a few more minutes to allow the rest of our attendees to log in, and we'll get started very shortly. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is David Robinson. I'm the Director of Membership and Meetings of the Linguistic Society of America, which is sponsoring this webinar. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. I hope you and yours are staying safe and healthy. While I'm talking, you'll be seeing a brief slideshow about the LSA and what we do. You'll also see some information about a special membership discount for participants in this webinar. We're excited to present this webinar introducing language revitalization and documentation, which is the newest section of the LSA's flagship journal, Language. We're grateful to our panelists for taking the time to participate and to you for being here. I'd like to take just a few moments to let you know how the webinar will work and to make sure that you're familiar with the GoToWebinar control panel. If you'd like to download copies of the panelists' slides, you'll find those in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar dashboard, and they will also be available on the LSA website after the webinar recording is uploaded. Also, you may have noticed that your microphones are muted. This is so that we don't get uh, miscellaneous background noise from all of you, but we do encourage you to ask questions at any time using the questions widget on your GoToWebinar dashboard. If your question is for a specific panelist, please let us know which one, and the panelists will answer them during the last part of the webinar. And then uh, before we get started, we'd like to take a quick audience poll so our panelists can get a better idea of who you are and what your relationship is to the field of language revitalization and documentation. So I'm going to bring the poll up uh, very quickly. And if you just take a moment to answer it, um, that would be great. And it should be launching now. OK. Yep, so go ahead and answer, and when uh, almost everybody or everybody has answered, we'll go ahead and close it and show the results to everybody.
Okay, we'll uh, just keep it open for a few more seconds here. All right, I'll go ahead and close it now. Um, let's see, here we are. And going to share the results with everybody. So uh, can you see the results? I think everybody can see the results. Yes, attendees are viewing. Okay, so uh, just over half of you are tenure track faculty, the equivalent, 10% postdocs, 25% students. These are all rough percentages, mostly 7% uh, linguists in industry, government, or the nonprofit sector, and 10% of you are language activists or community members. Okay, so can go ahead and hide that. Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Andres Kutsia. He's the editor of Language, and he'll be introducing the webinar for us. Thank you very much, David. So while David was talking, I lost internet connection and had to reconnect. Let's hope that it stays stable. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on you know where in the world you are joining us from. And thank you, David, for that clear explanation about how this webinar will work. As David had said, I am Andres Kutsi. I'm the editor of Language and a professor of linguistics at the University of Michigan. Before I get any further into this presentation, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm talking with you from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And as a community, we acknowledge that the university resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, comprised of the three fire confederacy of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, and also on the land of the Wyandot nation. As we are talking here today about language revitalization and documentation, I'm happy to acknowledge also that the University of Michigan does offer Ojibwe as a language in our Native American Studies program. This is an important start, but by itself, of course, it's not enough or sufficient recognition for the Native peoples on whose land we live and work. I'm really happy to be here with you today and to be joined by my friend and colleague, Colleen Fitzgerald. I'll do a slightly more formal introduction of Colleen in a minute or two, but for now, I want to start by briefly setting the scene and sketching the path that brought us to this point today the official launch of this new section of language, the section that is called Language Revitalization and Documentation. The Linguistic Society of America has had a long-standing commitment to language documentation, preservation, and revitalization. Some of the pioneers of American linguistics, and therefore also some of the early or founding members of the Linguistic Society, we're really deeply involved in documentation of the indigenous languages of North America, for instance. Um, a pivotal moment in the more recent history of the society's engagement with these topics was the publication of a collection of papers in language in 1992, spearheaded by Ken Hale, that focused on endangered languages. Right? These papers, the collection of, of these papers, are to today some of the most cited and downloaded papers that has appeared in language. And recently, they were also included in the third volume of the anthology of the best papers of language over the past 90 years that the journal has been published. The LSA has also, over the decades and years, made several statements officially expressing the society's support for language documentation and related activity. And here is just a sampling, right? If you spend time on the LSA website, you can find multiple of these statements over the years and decades. So here's just a sample. A 1994 statement on the importance of documenting linguistic diversity. Then there was a 1996 statement on language rights. And a little bit more recently, and more directly related to today's webinar, is a 2011 resolution recognizing the scholarly merit of language documentation. But most recently, most immediately, and the thing that really brought us to this point today, is a report that former LSA President Alice Harris prepared for the LSA Executive Committee in 2018, 
And this report focused on the importance of language documentation, and in particular, on the importance that there be peer-reviewed venues in which this kind of research can be published so that it can enjoy the same recognition as any other linguistics research. The, the message was this. If, as a society, we truly believe that documentation is a priority, then we need to create and support spaces where this kind of work can happen and where it can get the necessary recognition. So based on that report, the Executive Committee of the LSA then tasked us over here at Language to develop a section of the journal that focuses on this kind of research. And plans for this section was originally announced in 2019 to coincide with the United Nations International Year of Indigenous Languages. And then we got down to work, started planning out the details of how the section is going to work, recruiting editorial leadership for the section, thinking about what kinds of papers we will consider, how they will be evaluated, and so on. And I was absolutely delighted um, when Colleen Fitzgerald agreed to come on board as the first associate editor for this new section of language. As the inaugural associate editor, Colleen is playing a really central role in shaping the section, right? determining what its character will be and setting it on the course that it will follow in the coming years. And there is probably no one better qualified than Colleen to do this important task. So let me take this opportunity to introduce Colleen a bit more formally, and then I will hand over to her for the main part of today's presentation. Dr. Colleen Fitzgerald brings a wealth of experience and leadership in the domain of language documentation and revitalization to language. Her own research has focused very much on the documentation and revitalization of Native American languages, and has relied extensively on community-based research models. Between 2015 and 2019, Dr. Fitzgerald served as the program director for the Documenting Endangered Languages program at the National Science Foundation. And during her tenure in this position, she played a really important role in making collaboration with speech communities a core part of the activities funded by the NSF. After completing her term at the NSF, Dr. Fitzgerald then took on her current position as the Associate Vice President for Research at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. But fear not, although much of her time nowadays goes into supporting the research endeavors of this university, she still remains deeply engaged with linguistics and language documentation and revitalization research. She publishes widely in these areas, and she's a frequent keynote speaker on these topics, including at the 2017 annual meeting of the Linguistic Society. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald is someone who brings expertise and experience to this new section of the journal, and also someone who has a clear vision for why it is important to do this kind of work and how this kind of work should be done. And therefore, also somebody who has a clear vision for how this section of language should work. Colleen, I don't think I have said enough times how happy I am that you agreed to take on this position and join the language editorial team. Um, so let me again say thank you. And then with that, I will hand over to you to talk to us about your vision for language revitalization and documentation, this new section of language. I mean, I couldn't ask for a more beautiful introduction. Thank you. It, um, I appreciate the, I really appreciate the kind words and um, I appreciate the opportunity and the trust that you've put in me um, to get this section going. Thank you. All right, David, I think I have, oh, okay, I have mine zoomed too much. Just let me get the, there we go. All right. So, um, so I'm going to talk fairly briefly about um, a framework for language documentation and uh, language revitalization and documentation, the new section. Uh, I'm drawing pretty heavily uh, 
from the paper that just came out. So if you're a Linguistic Society of America member, you got the Blitz, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and um, it's an open access paper. Thank you to the Linguistic Society of America for committing to making that paper open. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a, a sort of overview of the kinds of papers and the kinds of assumptions that uh, I bring to this section. But I'd like to start and um, let you know where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the coastal bend of South Texas, a region that's the traditional homelands of the Karankawa people. Um, Texas has three federally recognized tribes, and Texas has really been uh, the homelands and crossroads for many indigenous people. Um, thank you. So, if we go to the context of this new section, um, Andres really outlined what the justification, the motivation was from the perspective of the Linguistic Society of America and the executive committee. And so I'd like to give a little bit more context on that. I think fundamentally, there's a recognition of the role that peer reviewed scholarship, peer reviewed venues has in terms of signaling the value and importance of a particular type of scholarship or a particular uh, domain, intellectual domain. And drawing from some research from other scholars in other fields outside of linguistics, the important role by disciplinary organizations, in our case, the Linguistic Society of America, um, has really been recognized as you know, the, the disciplinary organization can help highlight something and, and, and uh, provide a rubric or an acknowledgement of a certain kind of scholarship or pe perspective of scholarship um, or approach to scholarship as being valuable, but it can also play a negative role as well. But in our case, as linguists, the LSA has issued a number of formal statements or resolutions that address the importance and the value um, of the scholarly merit of language documentation, description, and revitalization. And those are the years of those are noted right there on the slide. They're also cited in my paper. They're available on the Linguistic Society of America website, and I would encourage you to um, you know, read them. But there's also some re realization from other scholars in our field about why this is important, in particular for work in language revitalization and documentation. And um, I've cited Dobin and Burson 2011 and Montoya 2020, where you know these are some cases of people arguing for hiring, tenure decisions, promotions, to coordinate with the kinds of contributions people are making in language revitalization and documentation. Um, Michael Krauss is another example of someone who really passionately advocated for, um, in his case, a lot of you know, dictionaries, grammars, being materials, uh, scholarly products that could get uh, earn you a PhD, earn you tenure, get you a job. So, um, you know, this is very important for our a, a reward system in academia to align with scholarship that we deem to be of value. And so this, set, this section, language revitalization and documentation, is formalizing that commitment um, to valuing that work, not just through resolutions, but through the act of creating an explicit venue for peer review. So um, that's a good way to let you know what the context of, uh, in, in terms of academia and our discipline is for this new section. Um, I thought it would be helpful to have some preliminaries for shared understanding in terms of language documentation and revitalization. So in terms of language documentation, um, I'm drawing from a classic quote from Himmelman 1998, um, quote, language documentation aims at the record of the linguistic practices and traditions of a speech community and may include a description of the language system. So this is a very holistic, um, broad definition of language documentation. And um, there's obviously more detail in the Himmelman 1998 paper, but this really informs the section that the documentation side of the section. 
And I think it's important to set to really explicitly note that language documentation is not e equivalent to using to language description. Um, Woodbury gives us a nice nice uh, discussion of the impact of the Boazian trilogy of descriptive linguistics, the grammar, the dictionary, and that set of an analyzed texts. They're not the end product of documentation, but they're part of the apparatus, the descriptive and explanatory material that annotates a documentary corpus. So these are not, um, you know, I, I wanted to really make sure I um, highlighted what what these def what kind of the definitions, the foundational definitions for the section were, because in my time as program officer at National Science Foundation, um, there there were proposals that were not in that in that larger space. And I think for my own work with um, communities or at training venues, it's that contextual um, language material that communities crave, communities want, and communities use to successfully re revitalize and reclaim their language. Um, Himmelmann has a really nice table of the language-related subdisciplines that influence the contents and makeup of language documentation, uh, sociological and anthropological approaches to language, so variationist, sociolinguistics, conversation analysis, uh, linguistic and cognitive anthropology, language contact, and so on, uh, theoretical, comparative, and descriptive linguistics, discourse analysis, spoken language research, rhetoric, language acquisition, phonetics, um, ethics, language rights, language planning, field methods, um, oral literature and oral history, corpus linguistics, educational linguistics. So a very robust discipline drawing from other disciplines that are not I mean it's obviously quite large quite expansive uh, quite interdisciplinary um, in turning to language revitalization uh, I've drawn from a description discussion of language revitalization by Leanne Hinton in the Green Book of Language Revitalization and that quote the development of programs that result in re-establishing a language that has ceased being the language of communication in the speech community and bringing it back into full use in all walks of life. So language revitalization is not equal to applied linguistics. And uh, I'm drawing here from a paper that um, Onoa uh, MacGyver recently wrote on indigenous language revitalization and applied linguistics um, as part of a keynote she did and talking about there's being a, a time during her scholarly development that she wondered if indigenous language revitalization should be a subfield within SLA, second language acquisition, but she came to understand that ILR is necessarily autonomous and rather than being subsumed by another field, the languages and communities involved are better served by the creation of interdisciplinary space for collaboration and partnership from independent places of strength. And she writes that as an indigenous scholar. And I think, um, you know, I, I would like to make sure people know, I, you know, I come to this as an outsider. I'm, I'm not an indigenous community member. I'm a white Western linguist. And I think that kind of positionality um, is really, uh, coming more to the forefront in a number of our different disciplines. And uh, I talk a little bit about that in, in a later section of this talk. So pulling from MacGyver's work, from work by a number of other um, uh, scholars in language revitalization and reclamation, um, as well as um, people working in related spaces, we might think of a possible synthesis um, akin to what Himmel, Himmelmann did for documentation for revitalization and synthesize those disciplines and subdisciplines that are influencing research into indigenous language revitalization. And here we might find decolonization theory, indigenous knowledge and ways of being, linguistics, education, second language acquisition, the learning sciences, social justice, language teaching and learning context, trauma studies, ethics, language rights and language planning, teaching methods, oral history and oral literature, indigenous methodologies, well-being and resilience. So uh, again, a broad umbrella um, that is falling under that 
language revitalization field discipline. So with our shared preliminaries, so we all have are on the same page, I want to talk about some of the possible, possible submissions that you can make to our new section. And um, we're going to start with language revitalization case studies, which I would, you know, again, Andres mentioned the Hale et al. papers, that collection, um, England 1992 is a great uh, exemplar of the role of training in language documentation, description, and revitalization. Uh, Watahomagi and Yamamoto 1992, uh, looking at the Wallapai community and the collaborative relationship between those two and the supporting the bilingual education efforts in that community. Um, so those are some really classic cases, uh, case studies of language revitalization that have already appeared in language. Uh, there's also papers that explore the relationship between documentation and revitalization. Uh, here you might look at uh, Raquel Yamada's paper on um, Carina uh, in 2007. Uh, I have some work in collaboration with Joshua Hinson on uh, Chickasaw, which is a language of Oklahoma. Uh, Raquel's work is, was based in Suriname. Uh, Rosa Vallejo's uh, work paper in 2014, Linda Langley and collaborators in 2018, and that's a paper looking, uh, Rosa's paper is the Kukama in um, the Amazon, the Langley paper is drawing from a Cushata collaboration deeply embedded in the community, coming from the community, um, and um, Margaret Flory looking at uh, training in Australia with indigenous communities there. So there's examples. And I think it's really important for you to be able to see papers that fit into this zone of um, possible submissions, but also to um, highlight the fact that there is a scholarly literature on language revitalization. And for scholars who are working in a field like language revitalization or language documentation, know that literature, cite that literature. Um, this is obviously not the entire literature, you know, right? We can only talk about snap, you know, bits and pieces here. But I think that um, you know, it's very important to be responsive and attentive to the existing literature in any discipline when you're working for a scholarly journal um, and um, for publication. And so that is, is something that I think is very important for people to be aware of. Another area of possible submissions are corpus overview articles. Oh my gosh, this is quite a long table, um, but I'm drawing from a paper by um, T. Berger, Margitz, Mori, and Musgrave in 2016 in the Australian Journal of Linguistics. And this paper is coming a bit also from um, funding agencies and wanting to be able to have criteria for evaluating uh, language documentation corpus. So how, um, you know, we're, we're actually just wrapping up, um, Josh Hinson and uh, our, our Chickasaw collaboration is wrapping up an NSF documentation project. And there's a lot of recordings and there's a lot of material and there's a lot of time that we have spent putting into that, um, you know, those recordings, the work, the work with elders who were no longer here. Um, so how do you take that kind of effort and work and have a scholarly rubric um, for evaluating the quality, the um, for for evaluating it, right? So um, in this article, they pull together three big criteria: accessibility, quality, and quantity. And within each category, each criterion, they you know illuminated it a bit more. So for accessibility, um, talking about the deposit, what re repository is it in? Is that repository going to provide long-term curation and access, including a persistent, persistent identifier, a citation form for items within the deposit? Is there a landing page or a file with a basic description of the deposit? Um, access to metadata and a clear path to accessing the data in the corpus. So what do we know about the recording? So what's the metadata? Uh, in terms of what's there, what, what do we know about the speakers and their knowledge and their um, you know, region that they came from or their relationships? Um, the files should be in a format, in formats that are non-proprietary. Uh, and if files are restricted, 
you don't evaluate them in that in that evaluation. So only the accessible portion of the deposit is reviewed. And it's uh, important to note that when um, typically when archivists are talking about accessible in cases like this, they do mean that you've been able to log in. Um, you, you know, you may have to register at the site. Most many archives don't just have their materials um, in the repository just um, on YouTube, for example, right? Um, so often you do have to register as a user to gain access um, for to, to the, the deposits, to, to the repository. So for quality, the nature and amounts and con of contextual background information, the structure of the deposit, um, metadata quality, and um, the nature of linguistic annotation of the data, and especially the structural linking of the raw data and their annotations, uh, so time-aligned transcriptions. If you're familiar with the LON software, that's one of the ways you can do time-aligned transcriptions. In terms of quantity, the content, so the range of speakers of various ages, genders, dialects, a range of genres, um, and the amount of materials, the amount of text, the number of items, the diversity among items, um, you know, and typically in terms of academic evaluation, there's going to be more value on the academic side given to deposits with more analytical work. So, for example, an interlinearized text collection where you have the text, you have a transcription of the text, you have a translation uh, into the dominant language, you have a um, linguistic analysis uh, of, the, of the materials. So this should hopefully give you a sense of what you would do if you wanted to write up a paper on um, your deposit that you had made or that your community had made um, or that a team that you worked on had made and put together um, and basically be able to have a paper for publication. These are the kinds of criteria and, uh, and aspects of that corpus um, that you would want to be able to address. Likewise, you can review a corpus using this criteria um, so this is a nice uh, example um, or exemplar of what you would look for, what we would look for in an overview of a Corpus article. And I have here some examples of uh, Corpus overviews. Uh, Shembri et al. 2013, so that paper is looking at sign language, sign language corpus. Um, Sophie Sofner, 2015, uh, that's in language documentation and conservation. Um, Gabriela Caballero in 2017 on Arara Muri. Uh, Lauren Gaughan in 2018 and Hildebrandt et al. 2019. Those four papers are all in language documentation and conservation, um, which has been a great venue for these contributions. We are also hoping that, that this section of language will, will do that. And, and you know, there's lots of people doing documentary work. There's lots of, it's, it's great to have a proliferation of venues because I think that really signals how important this subdiscipline is to our field and to our communities. Um, Hemmings 2020 is in another journal. Um, I, offhand, it's a British journal. Um, but again, examples of papers that have appeared in various places that exemplify that kind of scholarly contribution of a corpus overview article. Another area of possible submissions are research ethics and methodology. So um, again, we've seen these papers in language sometimes. Um, so it, in terms of ethical practices and research models, uh, Wilkins 1992, that didn't appear in language, but I, I think it's a really canonical early paper on ethical models. Um, Craig 1993, Rice 2006 uh, in the Journal of Academic Ethics, that's a paper I know I've drawn upon um, in order to put into my IRB applications that when I'm doing collaborative language documentation and revitalization projects, people typically want to be named and to give people the option to be named uh, whereas, you know, IRBs aren't familiar with that kind of mode. Um, Tchaikovsky Higgins 2009, again, a really canonical paper um, for uh, uh, community-based participatory research, language research, uh, and that's in language documentation and conservation. Leonard and Haynes 2010. Um, Bauer in 2010 is another paper on IRBs that appeared in language. Um, so those are, again, you know, this is a fruitful uh, area of analysis and extrapolating from these case studies to theorize about the ways of practicing 
research of conducting research and methodologies and models for research and ethical uh, approaches. Um, and then interdisciplinary approaches, some example papers uh, in music, looking at language and music in terms of language documentation. Um, Linda Barwick, in that 2000 paper is in uh, LDD, Language Description and Documentation, a journal out of the UK. Um, of McPherson 2019 is also another example. Uh, archival research, Mary Lynn 2014, that's a, a, another paper of those interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, the late Tucker Childs has a 2014 article that demonstrates sociolinguistic language documentation, sociolinguistic documentation. And Shulist and Rice is a nice overview of ethnography. So again, um, reflective of a field that is interdisciplinary, we should expect to see papers that might further probe or lay out models of interdisciplinary research. And then I wanted to make sure I also talked about, um, in terms of an area of possible submissions, the inclusion of diverse language scientists. Uh, so this is a quote from the paper, my paper. Um, the need for highlighting the ways in which a more diverse and inclusive group of scientists can advance linguistics and language documentation has never been more urgent. Um, I, I cannot tell you enough of the value I see in advancing science by having more inclusive perspectives, um, diverse perspectives, and um, people who bring different questions, different frameworks, different epistemologies to their scientific inquiry. That is, in my opinion, one of the major ways science has advanced. Um, and the next slide, I, I have some citations for you from other disciplines. Uh, so Nielsen et al. 2018, um, you know, in terms of research on women's health, in the 1980s, as more women entered the biomedical research fields, you started to see an increase in medical research on women's health, right? Different questions were being asked when you had different genders as the scientists. Um, that paper also finds a similar effect for biological anthropology, where there's a correlation in terms of the increase of women primatologists. Bolneck et al. 2019 is a nice set of articles demonstrating the impact of diversity on scientific knowledge and biological anthropology. Um, Haynes et al. 2020 notes that increasing the diversity in science can lead to new approaches for studying behavior, ecology, and conservation. Um, what they did is they looked at female at, at birdsong papers, and as you see more females entering, you know, right, um, female birdsong papers are correlating with an increase in female authors. So again, different different populations are studied, different questions are answered, different sets of data are brought into the research um, framework. So this is a really important way to advance knowledge. And we've seen recently this argument being made in a number of papers with regard to the language sciences. So in the last volume, um, the last issue of language, um, Charity at Hudley et al. Um, argued that the language sciences would benefit from disciplines that have developed race as a theoretical concept, so like sociology, anthropology, and psychology, as well as including interdisciplinary fields that, quote, center critical engagement with race and racism, like indigenous studies or Latinx studies. Uh, Leonard 2020 notes that a critical approach in which linguists recognize diverse epistemologies and research methodologies and thoughtfully select their approach for a given research need from this larger pool. So the entire set of papers in there um, really give a range of perspectives about how greater inclusion in the language sciences could diversify the discipline both among scholarship and among scholars. So um, I have a paper that has laid out my um, vision for the section in terms of making sure people know the assumptions that uh, I would work with as in, in terms of um, theoretical notions in the field. Um, I put in example papers and I've only, again, I've really only scratched the surface 
um, you know, so we can have some more time for discussion and Q&A. Uh, and I think David's going to put the link to that paper in the chat box. But I have one more comment to make about the section. I have one more slide. And that's that prospective authors should really implicitly consider what the article's contribution would be to an audience of general linguists, as opposed to those working in language documentation and revitalization. So this section of language is a section of language. And so really being mindful, as one should whenever one is submitting to a journal, of what the audience is um, and what kinds of papers are, are appearing in that uh, will really help uh, perspective authors think about how to structure um, structure your contribution and thinking about what what people outside of language documentation and revitalization would glean from that or get out of that so thank you okay thank you uh, both of both of you both Andres and uh, Colleen and um, now we've come to the part of the webinar where the panelists will take your questions. So again, you have a questions widget on your GoToWebinar dashboard. That is where you can ask your question. If it's for a specific panelist, please let us know which one. And we've already got a couple, so we will start uh, answering them. Um, and if our panelists can uh, go on camera now. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Colleen, um, for that. We already have two questions in the question side, so you know you can continue posting your questions there. But I just want to comment on something that Colleen said and then turn that into a question that addresses some of the questions we've already received. I, I really appreciate that Colleen focused so much on the the breadth of the kinds of papers and approaches we would be happy to consider. That is something that in general we've been trying to do with language, right? Language is the journal of the linguistic society. And with that society, I don't necessarily mean the organization of the community of people who are linguists. And the contents of our journal should reflect the work that people do who consider themselves linguists. And that includes a lot of this more interdisciplinary work that we don't typically see in the pages of our journal. If the journal has to be the journal of the community, then it should include those papers. And so I'm very happy when I heard Pauline say that it agrees with how we're thinking about the, the journal. And maybe this section is a place where that can happen. Um, but let me turn this into one of the questions that we received came from uh, Andrea Beres Croker. Um, and you, you briefly touched on it in your presentation, Pauline, but I think it's worth just thinking about it a bit more or saying how we think about it. And that is, um, how is this section of language going to play, you know, engage with the existing journals in this space? Is another one necessary? How is it going to be different from the others? Are we, are we going to augment or is it going to be competitive? So, so how do we fit into this space? Well, I would say, you know, one thing um, when I was asked to edit this section, I very purposefully called it language revitalization and documentation um, and fronted language revitalization um, in part because one of the things I see this section as being able to do, uh, given, for example, the Hale 1992 et al. 92 papers, is to um, just like language documentation and conservation um, did the tribute papers to Himmelmann 1998, um, I see there being a lot of potential for the next 2022, uh, which will be the 30th anniversary of the Hale et al. papers that will also be, which I think were until last month, uh, last last volume, I think those were the only papers that have had indigenous authors in, in the journal language. And so um, I, I view this as being um, a, a venue that's for general a general audience. And they're, you know, having, if I think about my time at National Science Foundation, where I was the only one in the building that, um, you know, was understood, um, language documentation and conservation from that um, 
community perspective, but also from the science of linguists, you're constantly thinking of how does your how does your discipline make sense to other people? And I think one of the things I'm maybe bringing into this is how does our discipline of language revitalization and documentation make sense to other linguists? And how can we um, find ways to show what our scholar, how our scholarship uh, advances knowledge? And in particular, what I would, what I'd like to, one of the things I'd like to do for 2022 is have a call for short papers um, from indigenous authors as sort of a response to Hail at All 92. Um, you know, I think what is what is scholarship in language documentation and conservation and, and revitalization. Um, I think that this is a, a, I think we've seen this is a field that's predominantly um, occupied by Western voices um, from majority perspectives. And I think um, it's always very interesting to hear what other people think is scholarship and what other people think is important. Um, so I'm hoping that we get a lot of different kinds of papers. Um, and I'm hope, really hoping that people are thinking, you know, what what out of my scholarship is has that relevance for another linguist? How, how do I need to think about my work when I'm not preaching to the choir? I, I very much like that answer, right? So another way that we think about papers in language is nearly any paper that you can publish, nearly any paper you can publish in a specialist journal, you can also publish in language the framing is going to be different, right? So the, the middle technical part might not be that different, but you you are addressing it to a broader audience. Yeah. And, and that agrees with what you said here, Colleen. And another thing that I was just thinking as you were talking, my research is mostly in phonetics and phonology. I have, you know, 10 top tier journals that I can submit to, right? So I think they're, there, for a, an active research field, it's good if there are multiple venues. We know how difficult it is to get published. We know the delays to publication. There is room for more in this field. And, you know, I think if we look at how, I, I agree. I mean, I think it really indicates the vigor of the discipline. And I understand, I think there's also another journal that's on, like, that's just language revitalization that's emerging. I heard that at the LSA meeting. So I think that tells us we have a lot of scholarship and a lot of interesting work people are doing and a lot of interesting people doing that work. And, but the audience is different from e for each group. And I think that's where, that's where, um, you know, I think that perspective is really important. Is this paper a paper for people who work in this discipline right, who are familiar with all the things, they know what you didn't put in the paper, right, they know what you left out of the references, versus uh, someone who might, you know, be reading the paper, you know, they, they look at the table of contents, and they're like, oh, that looks kind of interesting, I don't know what that is, I'll read the paper, and, you know, I'm thinking about implications like, this is someone who sits on their department TMP committee, and now they at least have a somewhat of an insight um, into the work that their colleague does, because they've read this paper. So I think, um, and I, you know, I would also say as when I was at NSF, one of the things I would often tell people is, have you published in language documentation and conservation? Because I think if you're someone who works in language documentation and conservation and you haven't published in that journal, then that's also kind of reflecting that you're not engaging with that other, with that audience. And so I think, you know, really different journals, different venues have different functions. I'm going to combine two questions here from Claire Bowen and Peggy Spees, since they kind of address similar questions. So um, talking about the type, you know, kind of, I think, talking about the, the corpus overview article that you referred to and asking about other types of materials. So um, the question from Claire Bowen asks, would it include, you know, the database overviews, like where the database might be not a corpus of the language, but for also a venue where you know um, work on the language is collected and and then a question from Peggy Spees which I think is related is saying the communities with which documentary linguists work often want educational materials children's books and these things are often not included in the budgets for 
funding agencies um, and not necessarily part of the corpora. So are those things covered in this section? Um, well, I would say that, um, again, having worked for a funder, that if you're talking about children's books, you're talking about a broader impact. And NSF, the PAPG, clearly states that broader impacts can appear in the budget. So um, at least as far as NSF, if you're framing it as the broader impact of your work, uh, you should be able to make the case that it's in the budget. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think in terms of the database question, my it, it would really be what is the what is the way in which the database is discussed and framed such that it's um, it's providing value to a reader who's not a database person? Um, if it's highly technical, then I think that's not going to work for a lot of audiences. If the database is not accessible, I think that's going to be another issue because what I could imagine from a database article um, or like an overview would be someone saying, oh my gosh, I, I want to go interact with that. Um, I want to go look at some inquiry. I want to make some inquiries and see what I can do. I want to, I want to, you know, maybe it's um, trying to see how the different, um, you know, what the, what the categories were for using for the different fields. Uh, maybe it was how detailed, um, you know, you went on the morphemic representation, um, how you handled allomorphy. You know, I just sort of speculating, but I think that um, a database that's open access, um, or again, you know, accessible via a login, and is, you know, framing something in a way as to why this is work. I mean, right with the subtext maybe being, okay, I'm going to show why this is work. Uh, I'm going to show why this is valuable and how this advances knowledge. Um, there's there's many questions, so I will have to start selecting because I. But you know, please keep posting um, your questions. So, so here is an important question that you know, I think you you addressed in your presentation partially, but I think it warrants addressing it more explicitly so that we are very clear on that. And it is saying that this this new section of language will it primarily publish articles on the theory and practice of language documentation and revitalization. But if we think about the products of these things, the corpora and things like that, um, they are unlikely to be peer reviewed. So is there a way that we can get them to get peer reviewed so that they can count towards, you know, for instance, hiring and things like that? So I think our goal is exactly to make that possible, right? It's one of the goals of the section. I mean, I think that. We, I mean, I think we're start. We have a starting point here. I think that's where I would kind of say, right? We have a starting point where we are laying out some types of things that the journal section will take. But by no means have we conceived of every single thing that might fall under the sky. And I would say, you know, if you were gonna, you had something and you weren't sure, write up a one-page overview of the paper that you're thinking. Um, which, you know, an abstract, which you would have to write for any paper. Um, but I, I think trying to think, is this, it, who is my audience for this paper? And, um, you know, is, I mean, I could imagine a paper that takes a really robust set of, um, you know, revitalization materials that are accessible in the same way a documentary, documentary corpus might be. And is like, I'm gonna review this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what the criteria are because this should be scholarly product and we don't have a model for that. It seems to me like if you write a paper like that, that's taken a corpus, set it to corpus, given a set of criteria by which it can be judged, you, you've basically done the corpus overview article in a meta way, right? You've done, you're, you've done a, docu a revitalization version of the Tiberger et al. paper. So I would think that was pretty cool. So one of the, one of the things that you know I, I mentioned in my brief introductory statements that um, this section was partially a response to the report that Alice Harris repair, prepared for the executive committee. And if I think about the discussion that happened at the committee meeting about that, this question came up, right? So people who do documentary linguistics spend years putting together an online corpus 
it lives online, it's open access such that the community can access it, which means it didn't go through the typical peer review of a journal article. As a community, linguists are starting to realize how to value that, but tenure and promotion committees might not. So one way is to, to write the corpus overview article, have it reviewed and published in language right. or in any of these other journals, and then that could be the peer-reviewed right. product. It, it doesn't still capture the amount of work, right? Because it's then one journal article for a corpus that you might have spent, you know, many, many years on preparing. But it gives it that, that you know, that kind of official stamp that deans might be looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't think you're ever going to have anything that's a traditional peer-reviewed publication that reflects all the work that one does with communities and does um, in terms of not only making the recordings and the relationships, but also processing and annotating those materials. Um, I, you know, you're it, you, sorry, but you picked a field that's actually that's quite labor intensive, and there will never, I don't believe, uh, at this moment, um, you know, be the kind of peer review to value that. But I, what I love about the corpus overview articles, and you know, um, and frequently told my PIs, and two of whom my principal investigators when I was at NSF, and two of them are on the list of articles that I mentioned, um, but I also was, that was something I told to count, countless um, PhD students or junior faculty, write it up. Here's a, you know, the Southner paper was out. Here's a model, write it up. And then you have a line for all the work you did in um, particularly, I think having a reward structure for the amount of labor to prepare materials um, to, to go into um, a long lasting repository. It's a lot of work. I, we actually had on our Chickasaw project, we Kind of budgeted and had had a um, have a student um, that we've worked with um, working on that because I, you know I knew how much work it was going to be. Um, so I, I think having those lines on your CV, you're never going to be able to um, have lines that correlate with the amount of quantity involved in this kind of work. But um, you know you're going to have some amazing relationships from doing this kind of work and. Um, so, you know, everybody, please keep on submitting any questions you have about the section or about, you know, any of the broad issues we're we're talking about here. So, Colleen, let me um, direct you to another one of the questions that we received from Heather Suter. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Saying that, you know, I will I will read the question. I see great possibilities for including the writings of indigenous scholars. Uh, and a place to represent the interests of indigenous speech communities who have the greatest interest in their languages. But how do you see engagement with indigenous scholars and communities who are not linguists? So how do we engage with them and get them involved in publications in language, the journal of the linguistic society? So how can we include these non-linguist members who participate in this work in a publication in language? Well, I think um, there's certainly growing numbers of indigenous linguists at various career stages in the pipelines, whether it's, and I know I, I, some of them mentioned they were coming to this webinar, so I know there's indigenous PhD students, there's indigenous assistant professors, and there's indigenous uh, associate professors and full professors, right? One of my committee members, Dr. Ophelia Zapata, an indigenous linguist. So I don't know, I, I, without knowing when you say non-linguist that you mean a community member who doesn't have a master's or PhD in a language related field, because it could also be a non-linguist, someone who is an anthropologist or someone who is a, a musicologist and working from that framework. But I would say co-authoring is a great way to work collaboratively and have intellectual contributions recognized. Um, and I, that's a model that I think many people have used. There were certainly a number of co-authored work in papers in that Hale 1992, Hale et al. 1992 set of articles. And um, we certainly see that co-authored scholarship, co-presentations model working well in the field. So that's that's an important point. And you know, so 
So this the section came to be because the LSA executive committee tasked at, us at. Okay, I just froze. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay, so the executive committee tasked us to develop this section, and therefore we did so. More recently, they've tasked us to develop guidelines about authorship, right? So because models of authorship are changing. So how does one define an author? And, you know, we don't have to reinvent that wheel. Many disciplines have already worked on that. So I think we need to look at the role of a, you know, a community member who works with you as you as the trained linguist collect the data and do your work. At, at what point does that person become a co-author on the paper, right? That's, well, those are things if, we need to think about. And I think if you look at Tchaikovsky Higgins 2009, uh, it's really recognizing that in these projects, there's lots of different kinds of expertise. And, you know, as a linguist, you're bringing one kind of expertise, but you're by no means the only expert in the room. And so, um, you know, I think that is really important. I think another way that you can um, help reach these goals is to think about who you're citing and whose work you're citing and to be uh, intentional um, about the voices that you're including in in those in those papers that you're writing and um, and you know I think there's also lots of different kinds of um, lots of different kinds of projects so uh, I can tell you Josh Hinson and I you know we have a we have a paper we're working on that we don't know where we're going to put but it's you know it's on broader impacts of our documentary project and all the contributions that we made in terms of um, maybe not um, publishing a grammar on, uh, you know, from our work, but the number of people who were trained, the um, capacity building, all these, you know, byproducts that are, in, you know, broader impacts. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways in which uh, language is approached and language materials are approached. And there are lots of different venues and lots of different publishing places and lots of different audiences. So I mean, that paper where you know I kind of like it to go, in, in the, it's actually like a policy journal because I, it's kind of responding to National Science Foundation's notion of broader impacts. But I, you know, I think it's too linguistically, too linguistically, to go to that, right? So you know, you always have to think audience. So another kind of concrete answer to that question. Um, Colleen was right in saying that there's been very, very few indigenous scholars who published in language. Um, over the past year, we've had two papers appear, one by Lena Mickelson from UC Berkeley on, you know, some complicated syntactic phenomenon in Karuk. And she, as a matter of principle, included a lot of her Karuk language consultants as co-authors because even though they weren't trained linguists, they helped their figure out the analysis, right? They contributed more than just the data. And we had another paper, I'm just now blanking on the authors, um, looking at the acquisition of kinship terms in Australian languages. And again, they included their consultants because they say, we couldn't figure these complex kinship term relationships out on our own. The, the community members contributed as much to the analysis as we did and they were co-authors for that reason. I mean, if I were to go to museum studies, um, you know, I, there's a big kind of movement, there are big movements in, in um, some of the museums in Europe that have collections that right. are attributed to Western European discoverers yeah. or scientists, no, but it's, really. it's, that's not really where the knowledge came from. The knowledge came from particular indigenous communities in other yeah. continents. And so I think the whole role of knowledge, right? There is a theory, of, there are multiple theories of knowledge and who is a knowledge creator. And I think a more ecumenical, inclusive model of who is a knowledge generator, um, again, can advance scholarship and knowledge because you're including those um, voices and, and it's informing your scholarship and, and inquiry just as much as you being a linguist, you know, changes the questions of the people you collaborate with. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Claire Bowen just posted. There's a few other indigenous scholars in language that we you know, might have not realized. Um, a, a paper by um, Felicity Meekins and colleagues in a recent issue 
also had some co-authors. Um, so I saw a you know, there's now enough questions that I need to scroll to I, find I, them. I saw. But I would point out that's still almost 30 years, right? I think the 92 papers were the first time, I think. And then it sounds like, right, there's a couple of more recent papers. And so I think this is telling us this is where the field is going and um, that co-authoring is the right model for including your co-knowledge creators. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's one question that came in that is a very specific question. And I, you know, can't find the person now who asked it, but the question is, will the papers in this section be open access? So I, I can answer that, um, but I saw about as I wanted to, Colleen wanted to say something. Do you? You go ahead. So um, publications in language are all open access after one year. So um, everything in language becomes available after one year. Before the one year time period, it can be made immediately open access that comes at you know a payment of an article processing fee which at the moment is four hundred dollars which i realize is a lot of money for people especially people working in fields that might not have the large grants that natural sciences would have um, to the extent we can um you know we sometimes support scholars to make their work open access without paying the fee or the LSA paying the fee. But the, the general approach is everything open access after one year, uh, an article processing fee before that. There is an open access fund at the LSA. So, and as you know, there was very recently a fund drive for that. So a, a way in which to get us to make more papers available immediately open access is if, if you have the ability to support that fund, that's a, a way to contribute to this. Um, uh, Colleen? Two, yeah, two questions. One is, do you think there would be interest if there was, I mean, I don't know if there's interest in the community of scholars, but if somebody said to the LSA, um, we want to do a fundraising campaign for papers in language revitalization and documentation to be open access, so a targeted open access fundraising. Yeah. I. I, I don't know the answer to that, you know, and I and I feel I shouldn't speak here on behalf yeah, yeah, of the, of the officers of the LSA, but, you know, we can make such a proposal. Make and such. I had a um, membership in the LSA in terms of authorship. So that that is a, a requirement for publication in language. Every Every paper should have at least one person who is a member of the linguistic society. It's not a requirement for submission, right? So you can submit a paper even if none of the authors is a member. But if a paper is accepted in order to be published, there needs to be one author that is a member of the society. Um, it is again something that we do periodically waive, you know. So we want the journal to be broad and we want topics to appear in the journal that that we think belong in the under the eyes of linguists, but that might not be typical linguistics publication. So we sometimes do get submissions that we accept and publish from people who don't identify primarily as linguists, such that their professional affiliations might be with other societies. And then I think it is unreasonable to expect of them to join the linguistic society. So uh, as on a case by case basis, as warranted, these things can be waived. Are there any other things people should know about submitting to language? I, uh, maybe David can also put the link to the portal. Um, no, you know, um, read the instructions on the web page for for submission. Um, we use a double blind review process, so make sure that you remove your identifying information. Um, one thing that we do, but many journals nowadays do it, is don't worry about formatting of the initial submission. In fact, you know, make it as easy as possible for people to read. So don't move tables or figures to the end, you know, just keep them where they belong. Um, once a paper is accepted, that's when we worry about how it should be formatted. So we, we want to make it easier to submit and, and also easier on the reviewers and the readers of the paper along the way. The, the language website, 
contains a lot of information. It is not the most user-friendly website. So, um, you know, you might have to dig around a little bit, for instance, to find the general instructions for authors. Um, we are limited in how the website can be formatted by the editorial management system that we use. So um, I'm always trying to make it more user-friendly, but it's it's not it's not optimal. If you are unable to find anything or uncertain about how to go about doing it, um, you know you can find the general editorial email on the website or just email me directly at my private email. Um, I spend enough time on that website that I know exactly where what lives. So I'm, I'm always happy to give you directions. And you've already saved me a couple of times with the, my interface with it. So thank you. <laughs> it is it is really not a very user friendly interface. <sighs> yeah. Um, so another question that came up, and I will you know try to find who asked it. I can't now locate it quickly enough in the list of questions. Is you know we've talked about the different kinds of papers that will be considered for this section including um you know these describing corporate type papers um and papers on methodology and, and ethics but what about papers that kind of theorize documentation that talk about you know ethical questions or questions of inclusion so so more general philosophical papers on this field of research if they're they framed, also... I mean, I, it seems it seems like if they're framed in a way that's respective of the kind of audience and of readership, then there certainly might be interest. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I do think that people are theorizing about documentation and inclusion. So the other thing I would also say is there is a robust literature. There's a robust literature. I certainly didn't cite everything I could have cited in my paper. Um, I tried to make sure I hit uh, a diversity of voices and but I mean again in any paper you can't cite anything everything but I, I do think um, that people do not always review the existing literature and um, you know they might have their literature on the language family and that language but not actually the framework and assumptions um, in terms of documentary linguistics, in terms of language revitalization and reclamation. Um, and so I think, you know, again, part of what makes a field of scholarship scholarly is by being responsive and situating your work in the literature. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, this as a section of language is kind of an ideal place to do that, to, to take that bigger, more philosophical, yeah. generalist view of what it is we do when we do documentation um <clears throat> you know we've we've about reached the end of the questions that have been posted in the question box <clears throat> we have more time left so if you are in the audience you know and you still have a burning question you would like to answer post it or you know if i have somehow missed your question repost it so that i see it again showing up at the at the bottom end of the list um one very specific question that we received is, um, and this is a question that I will now kind of give a general answer about language. It's a question we do get from time to time. Many journals publish kind of special issues where there's an issue dedicated to topic X and a guest editor that does that. Um, do we do it at language as a general principle? No, language doesn't do special issues um because we want it to be the general journal for the whole linguistics community right and if you look at any specific issue of the of the journal you will see that there's a range of topics covered in every issue from multiple subdisciplines the the sections of language of which we now have added uh, a third one right so we have now language revitalization and documentation we have teaching linguistics as a section and then language and public policy as another section. These sections are a little bit different than the, the place where the, you know, the, the main section of the journal 
um, they 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 publish different kinds of articles. The editorial leadership for each of those sections sometimes take a somewhat different approach than the main section of the journal. So there there is a bit more space in these sections to experiment and to step outside of the bounds of the traditional approach at language. Um, so I, I don't know, Colleen, if that's something that you think about. I, I think in general, you know, we want to keep it as open as possible. A special section eliminates everybody who doesn't participate in it. But, you know, it's, it's not written in stone. Yeah, I think I would say it's probably not the time to do that for a journal that has just launched. Um, because I, I, you know, part of why, you know, so you encouraged me to write this paper, right? You were like, write your paper, um, you know, kind of give people a sense of what, what to start with. And, you know, we had some interaction when we were talking about the paper that there's going, as we go down the line, there's going to be a lot of other kinds of things that fit into this. Um, but to just sort of set some goalposts starting off for how people might think of their scholarship and put it into this section. And I think to have a special issue when we haven't had any papers come out at this point, it, it, I would be worried that what it would do is preempt people from seeing themselves as submitters to this section mm -hmm. and that it would have a stamp set, set an identity that might people, people might feel not included. And, you know, I think, again, I wrote, I wrote a paper, I gave you some, wrote, I gave you some goalposts. I, We'll see how people do with those goalposts. Uh, I feel like there's been a lot of interest in this section. Um, and I think that we will get a lot of submissions and I really look forward to what's going to come out. Um, I do think I will, like I said, I think I will have some sort of special 2022 anniversary call. Um, but, you know, I think that's a little, I, I view that as a little different because it's not curated in the same way as a special edition. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think, not the right time and that's an approach that we have taken at language right so in in, yeah. in when it was in 2019 with the international year of indigenous languages we put out a call and say we are particularly looking for submissions about indigenous languages this year it wasn't a special collection of the journal we just specifically encouraged people working in that domain to submit and we got a whole bunch of submissions to deal in that but there wasn't a special issue of the journal. They were just entered into the regular editorial process and they're appearing in the regular journal as they go through the process. So that is that is certainly a, a, an option, it certainly is. So here's one question, Colleen, that I had missed. And then thank you for the person for reposting to say, you know, you, you missed this one. And this is kind of a more general question about, um, what it means, what language revitalization means, saying you know that the definition by Hinton from 20 years ago roughly might have to be revised, right? Because that focuses very much on on reversing yeah. a language shift that has gone all the way. What about language revitalization of languages that aren't gone yet but endangered? Is that also revitalization? Do we need to to broaden the identity, the definition of revitalization. Well, I, again, I would say that that's a guide point, guidepost, um, and to um, you know frame the journal with uh, terms from you know for people who are in language documentation and revitalization adjacent disciplines in linguistics. Those are terms that I think people have heard, and um, you know I think a lot of people might use. The, might frame things as language reclamation, uh, as Wes Leonard defines it, um, really driven by community's agenda. And um, but I, you know, I think I just am trying to sort of set some stuff out so that we at least have a sort of first pass on what we are going to share as the assumptions. Um, but you know, again, um, I mean, I, I think that revitalization is a pretty broad space. But using that word versus, say, reclamation or another, um, you know, um, there's other other words as well. Just try. I'm trying to go with a familiar. Um, and um, but I, I 
am not by using that definition i am not making any um judgment about what state the community is and um i would actually you know remind you in the um 2017 paper that i published in in language talked about um the vitality of a language being indicated not only by the classic hallmarks but by language revi revitalization and reclamation activity so mm -hmm. so um uh, we we haven't received any new questions colleen so i will you know say one or two things but you know maybe you can think if you have a, a final words of wisdom to speak we're also approaching roughly the 90 minute timeline so we are also getting closer to the end um and, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see yes david excuse me there there is one that i think you may have uh, missed and i can i, I can't re-forward it to you but i could uh, read it if you'd like sure. go ahead Thank you, sure. It's, it says, uh, thank you, Tomas, for the webinar. We are interested in a conversation about a possible focused publication for our region's endangered languages. How should we proceed and who do we contact in the LSA? And then it um, says, thank you. And it's Pefi Kingi. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the names. Susanna Tiapula in the Pacific region. I would, I'm, I'm, well, so without knowing what is meant by focused publication, I might think that it was a special issue, kind of the same response as the special issue. Um, I, but again, you know, if it's something that would be for a general audience, then the section would be appropriate. But I think there's also, again, I mean, as uh, Andrea asked earlier at the, at the beginning, you know, there, we do, or we are seeing a wealth of venues for this kind of scholarship. Um, and language documentation and conservation is certainly one of those article uh, journals. Language description and documentation, LDD, is another. Um, Oceanic linguistics, depending on the angle. Um, so there's there are a number of um, content, you know, a number of platforms. If language in this section of language um, is not the appropriate one, hopefully that answers your question. Um. So, you know, one, one comment I will make here, not to that question, is there's been one or two posts of people um, posting in the question, but not an actual question, saying, thank you very much. I'm so excited about this section. I have a paper that I'm working on and I hope to submit soon. So, thank you. If that, if that describes you, we would be happy to receive your submissions. And, um, you know, it's a new section. So, you will be the groundbreaker if you submit now, but we have an experienced team, including Colleen, who has a lot of experience in evaluating research, working with people to improve their research. So I think it's going to be a, a good venue and I would welcome your submissions. Um, Colleen, we, we have like four or five minutes remaining before we are at the end of our 90 minutes time. Um, is there anything that, that you would like to say kind of in closing? Yes. Um, in advance, uh, I would like to thank all the people who will be willing to review for this section. Um, having, again, just worked as a program officer where you rely extensively on reviews by people in the field, um, I cannot tell you how much um, in this new role I will rely on your insight, on your willingness to contribute your service to the discipline and to help us co-construct this section and this, um, you know, this, this knowledge. And if you are not sure that I know you and you want to volunteer as a reviewer, please feel free to ping me and let me know um, because uh, I, I will, I will, you know, I'm sure look you up because, um, we cannot do work like this without people in our profession and discipline. And the Linguistic Society of America, again, if you're, you know, sometimes people get a little, I, I, we have a number of publishers that are not like making scads of money. And I think the Linguistic Society of America's journal language, it's not making scads of money off of your service as a reviewer. So in particular, I just would say, thank you in advance, um, the generosity and attention to detail that reviewers bring to that service is incredibly valuable and i look forward to you accepting my email when i send it 
and I will echo that. Um, right, this journal language of which we are the, the shepherds at the moment, it's community property. It belongs to the community of linguists, which goes beyond the LSA. And um, we can't run the journal. The journal can't function as it does if we don't have reviewers and authors and associate editors and people who are working together. It is kind of amazing, you know, every time this new issue just appeared today or yesterday, every time it appears and I think how many people touched that journal, that issue, how many reviewers were involved, authors, copy editors. It is a, it is a, it's community property and community engagement that makes it happen. So and thank think, you for me too. Yeah, and I, and I think we're, both of us are really excited to see your excitement um, for us launching this section. And thank you for being such a dedicated group. And we look forward to the submissions. We look forward to you reviewing. Uh, and if you have any ideas, maybe we'll do a session at the LSA in DC. Um, and you know, if you have any ideas about what you would like to see out of a session like that, again, please feel free to ping me. And I think that is about it for us today. If there's remaining questions, um, send us an email. We can always take the conversation there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. And thank you to our ASL interpreters who also thank worked you. very hard during this 90 minutes. And uh, Andres, you took the words out of my mouth. Thank you, uh, Colleen. Thank you, Andres. Thank you to our interpreters. And thank you to all of you in the audience who took the time out of your day to be with us. We will have a recording of this webinar available possibly later this afternoon, but at any rate, no later than Monday. And I will send around an email when it is ready to view. So in the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Colleen. Okay. Bye, David. Bye-bye.